Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Angela Peacock. I was trained as a social worker and a therapist, but I'm also a subject of the film Medicating Normal. I volunteer doing outreach for the film, and I host conversations like this one today. Today is our 45th interview, and our guest is Dr. Ann Guy. We first met her, uh, well, I've, I've known about her for a couple years, basically from her guidance for, for psychological therapists about um, psychiatric drugs and withdrawal. And she doesn't know this, but when I do screenings with therapists in the U.S., I give them the guidance and I say, please read this. This will help you. So I'm trying to slowly spread uh, that guidance to the U.S. So let, without further ado, let me read you her bio. Dr. Ann Guy is a psychotherapist in private practice, having previously worked as a lecturer at the University of Roehampton. She is a member of the Council for Evidence-Based Psychiatry, the Secretariat Coordinator for the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Prescribed Drug Dependence, and Associate Member of the Institute for Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal. She is the lead editor for Guidance for Psychological Therapists, Enabling Conversations with Clients Taking or Withdrawing from Psychiatric Drugs, created in col collaboration with the leading UK therapy organizations and academics. She has co-authored co articles on patients and therapists' experiences of psychiatric drug and drugs and reports for the APPG de describing current and potential service models for supporting prescribed drug dependence in the UK. She chairs the Withdrawal Services Working Group, convened to define patients' needs, and sits on the NHS Advisory Group for the nhs e &I program, considering the implementation of ph &E's recommendations for action on prescribed drug dependence. That's, sorry, that's such a mouthful. Welcome, <laughs> Dr. Guy. <laughs> I'm so excited thank to you. be with you today. So thank you very much for having me. I've just realized how many, how many abbreviations there were in that bio. Sorry well, about that. <laughs> to me, that's just so much, so much you're doing. You have your, you have your foot in a lot of organizations, which is so important. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, there's so much going on across so many different organizations at the moment. It's a very vibrant field certainly in the UK at the moment. Amazing. All right so let's start with some questions and, and while we go we'll probably have uh, questions from the audience so feel free to type your questions hey, great. below and we'll we'll get them in there. So first can you talk about what led you to be a therapist because I know you came from the financial industry over to therapy. Yeah yeah um, yeah I worked in health insurance for 20 years I kind of drifted into this corporate career and you know it was great for a while but it increasingly was pretty unsatisfying um, and I just wanted to do something that was going to be of more value um, just felt more valuable more worthwhile and I'd been volunteering for an emotional support charity called Samaritans in the UK wow was that a, an eye-opener you know in terms of the range of people's experiences and the depths of despair that some people live their lives in and so it kind of inspired me to decide to train as a therapist. And um, so that's what started me off down that path. Wow, that's amazing. And I, I, we meet so many experts and I always like to ask this question, how did you learn about psychiatric drugs and like the impact they were having on patients and that there could be problems for some people? Like, how did you figure that out? Well, I, I, none of the credit goes to me. It all goes to Robert Whittaker, which I suspect for many people. Everybody I, I read says his, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I read his book, Anatomy of an Epidemic. I took it on holiday uh, to read, as uh, some light holiday reading lying on a sunbed in Greece. And I became a prescribed drug dependence bore virtually immediately. <laughs> Felt sorry for my husband. I kept quoting bits at him for the entire holiday. Um, but yeah, no, I was, I was shocked. I was really shocked by what I learned from reading that book. And in particular, that I as a therapist might be unwittingly compounding harm because I did not know enough about psychiatric drugs and particularly what they could, what they could do if somebody was withdrawing from them. I had absolutely no insight or knowledge on, on, on that. Um, and I realized from reading Robert's book that I might be inadvertently seeing withdrawal reactions as relapse, as a return of an original problem, and locating that issue with the individual rather than with the drug. So that, that was how I, how I learned about it. And I started having conversations with colleagues. And one of those colleagues was Dr. James Davies, um, who 
hopefully many of your audiences might uh, many of your audiences heard of um and discovered how deeply involved he was in in the subject and just said look if there's any opportunity to be involved if you need any help let me know and um, yeah five years later <laughs> here we are <laughs> oh, yeah. my gosh so now i'd like to get into the work of um the guidance let's just say the guidance for now so as you know i'm going to bring myself in here for a minute that i went through a very brutal withdrawal experience where you know it was like hell opened up and i had no idea this was such a thing i was really caught off guard i was you know shocked that a psychiatric drug could do the amount of damage that i experienced mm -hmm. and i was during that time i was extremely suicidal which i know many of our um audience members now may be experiencing the same thing but i was able to find a therapist who actually was caring and listened to me and understood and she didn't know everything about withdrawal but she was open-minded enough that i could teach her a little bit and she did her own research <clears throat> and um she really did kind of i don't i don't want to be dramatic and say she saved my life but she really did provide a safe place for me to experience the withdrawal experience without rushing me off to the hospital or telling me i needed a psychiatric drug and when i was thinking about it last night i was like that took a lot from her you know that she i was her first patient that ever had this experience but she didn't do what status quo would tell you to do where you refer back to psychiatry you tell the person they probably need medication and you probably put them in the hospital so can you share a little bit about this guidance? It's called Guidance for Psychological Therapists Enabling Conversations with Clients Taking or Withdrawing from Psychiatric Drugs. And what is it exactly? And how has that guidance been received both in the UK and in the US? Sure. Well, I don't know what it's like in the States when it comes to training as a therapist, but in the UK, when I trained, which you know is about what, 10, 15 years ago now, um, we were explicitly told not to talk about psychiatric drugs. It was um, regarded as um, the province of doctors and that you can't get into any conversations about drugs um, at all. And when I realized what a gap this left and how damaging that could potentially be for clients, um, I wondered, well, there must be some guidance out there for therapists somewhere. And I went to my professional organisation in the UK, a couple of them, and, you know, went to look at their fact sheets. So there's bound to be one I can download. There was nothing there. So um, once I got the opportunity, I started talking to colleagues and to when I was on the secretariat for the all party parliamentary group saying, would it be possible for me to explore starting to create some guidance. And we were uh, got the green light from, from everyone and the accrediting organizations in the UK put up some small amount of money, but to, for us to do the project. So the British Association for Counseling and Psychotherapy, BACP, um, UKCP and the British Psychological Society, BPS, were all involved. Um, and we invited all of the relevant academics and psychotherapists and experts on ethics that we needed to pull together guidance, current guidance based on current evidence. And that included inviting Professor Joanna Moncrief to contribute latest information, but from a critical perspective about what psychiatric drugs actually do. So along with Joanna, Professor John Reed, James Davies, Professor um, Rosemary Risk. I mean, we really did have a dream team to pull this together, most of whom there was, you know, no money at all involved. And we decided, OK, we need to describe what the drugs do or don't do. And so Joanna contributed a huge amount of material for that. So there's really accessible summaries about how drugs are meant to work, what the evidence says, and also information about what's the evidence about how therapy can work alongside psychiatric drugs. Because there's this whole idea out there that it's sort of the gold standard somehow to have both drugs and therapy, when actually the evidence for that is really not very strong at all. It's pretty non-existent. So that, that's in the guidance. It's really just bringing together all of the latest evidence around drugs and around their potential impact on therapy. 
But then we also explore, well, how does all of this information intersect with the actual practice of therapy? So if you're in the room with a client, what questions are you going to get asked? What does it matter about what you think about the drugs? What's your own experience of psychiatric drugs? What have you seen friends and family maybe go through? How do you believe they work? What have you been told? So it kind of invites people to examine their own understanding and history with psychiatric drugs, because we've all got it in some shape or form. And then to actually think through concretely, okay, practically speaking, the difference between, for example, giving medical information and giving medical advice. Now, this is such a useful point. There's absolutely nothing to stop therapists giving evidence-based medical information. And in fact, we all do it all the time. We all share medical information amongst each other because it's what we do as human beings. We share information. What we can't do is give medical advice. And we need to be really clear with our clients that we can't give medical advice. But what we can do is educate ourselves on the latest evidence. And really, the entire guidance is an invitation to therapists to educate themselves. It's explicitly giving them permission and actually saying, not only have you, are you allowed to do this, we're encouraging you to do this. Because we're trying to counter these years and years of people being told, oh no, you can't have these conversations, you shouldn't be talking about it. There needed to be this explicit invitation from, um, <clears throat> excuse me, from the relevant bodies to actually invite their members to educate themselves. So we hope, I hope that it's sort of, there's a, yeah, there's theory in there, there's evidence and, and, and um, I, I'd originally envisaged that it would be like two or three pages. <laughs> once, no. one, once we got everyone involved and we realized it, it, it did become rather large, but we have done a, a shorter version for people who don't have much time. But yeah. it does get very practical as well in terms of how to work with people who are thinking about withdrawing from their drugs, what you can, um, how you might be able to support somebody actually going through withdrawal as well. So it covers quite a range of information as very, well as very practical information about how to um, integrate this into practice. One of the most important things I found when I was a student, I actually read the guidance and I was like, oh my gosh, just asking the question, like, what does it mean for you to be on a psychiatric drug? Just that question. Yeah, that is just that opens a whole, you know, exploration that we don't talk about. And so I can verify for you in the US. No, we don't learn anything about psychiatric drugs. We are told that's hands off. You talk to the doctor only you leave it alone. But I know for a fact, because it even happened to some one of my family members, uh, she said, well, the, the therapist says that my niece, my daughter needs uh, a psychiatric drug. And I was like, first of all, how would she know that? And second of all, it felt, it feels very lazy to me. Like when the therapist has run out of avenues or feels like they're not helping, they want to refer to psychiatry. It's like, well, I've done all I can here. You need to go get medicated, you know? And it's just, there's more to it. I don't know. Yeah. I mean that, I don't recognize that particularly for the UK. It would never occur to me to recommend somebody go see a psychiatrist, probably because I know what I know. And my research that I did when I trained was how the medical model influences the practice of therapy. So this is before I knew anything about the, the whole problem with some of the psychiatric drugs. Because we know, if you've trained as a therapist, we know that all of the models of therapy assume psychosocial causes for distress, that it's what's happened to you, not about what's wrong with you. It's not about anything biological. It's about what's happened to you. So the idea that there might be some kind of biological fix for something that's happened to you, it, it, it wouldn't occur to me personally to... Um, let me let me qualify that because I'm not anti-drug. There are some very, very, very defined circumstances in which drugs can be helpful. I think if somebody's um, experiencing real distress with a um, an extreme psychotic break, for example, 
then short term use of some antipsychotics, I think, can be helpful. So, I, you know, it, this is not about being anti drug. It's really about informed consent. That's what it's about. It's about people being told up front what it is that the benefits might be, but what the harms might be and what what the risks are associated with coming off them eventually. And that's what's really lacking at the moment is that informed consent piece. I absolutely agree with you. And that's kind of the spirit of the film. You know, we're not anti-drug, but we are pro-informed consent. I think I even said that in the film. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's about, important. You know? Yeah, you should know what you're getting into. And unfortunately, many of us don't know that before and we find out after. Yeah. Yeah. So when coming off psychiatric drugs, um, one of the withdrawal symptoms is emotions are all over the place. You can feel suicidal, homicidal, you know, angry one second. You know, it's like a, a big roller coaster that almost mimics, you know, a different dis disorder that can get you put right back on medication. Mm. So while your brain and body is kind of balancing out, um, some people do seek therapy. But do you ever think that therapy while in psychiatric drug withdrawal could e either be co counterproductive or even harmful? I think it all comes down to what the therapist knows at that point, because um, you need to know enough to ask the question, has anything changed in your medication history? And um, if it has, to understand that it's a possibility that what somebody might be experiencing might be associated with withdrawal. Because if you locate the source of very distressing emotions with the person rather than with the drug, absolutely you might end up disappearing down bunny holes that really are not going to be productive because it's not about the individual it's about their response to a drug leaving their system so so much about the guidance is it's almost like it, it, it is really like an iceberg that you might have all of this information but actually the client will only ever see that this this much then it might just be a couple of key questions that you know to ask so that you work with something appropriately, so that you don't inadvertently blame an individual essentially, or locate the problem with the person rather than with the drug. But it's so helpful. I've been, um, I'm starting to get clients come specifically to me to work with this issue now because of the guidance people have found me over the years. Um, and if I can start working with somebody before they start their withdrawal journey, we can kind of benchmark, we can say, okay, well, what's normal for you? Where were you before you started taking the drug? What kind of things did you experience? Where are you now? And let's monitor it as you slowly start to withdraw. So that we've kind of got a chance of saying, okay, a very, very wise and experienced practitioner, Baylissa Frederick, who I'm sure you know, um, she's always been absolutely adamant in saying that any emotional reaction pretty much that arises once you start withdrawal the first assumption is that's about withdrawal and that's that's where we start we're assuming it's that kind of unless we can prove otherwise you know fair enough if you've just been bereaved if you've just lost somebody fair enough those emotions might be about that but if there's no nothing else going on default assumption is it's about the drug but it's very hard it's harder if you start working with somebody when they're already in withdrawal and um i know some people seem to be able to tell for themselves that this is about the drug they talked about some emotions kind of almost having a chemical feel i've read um but for others, it's really not so clear. So you, as, as ever in therapy, you've got to be guided by the experience of your client, you yeah. know? Yeah. From a, from a patient's perspective, I can share that I'll, I'll get so worked up about a certain topic or a certain person and like just upset and I'll just keep going over it and over it and just worried about it and freaking out. And like, I needed somebody to talk to and then I'll calm down later. And I'm like, what was the big deal? And it's like, oh, that that wasn't even you that was just this chemical flurry and it's like what was I even worried about I don't understand but it's like when you come when you're on those prescribed drugs for so long you almost forget like what emotions are mine what are from the drug 
What is my baseline? How do I even really feel about things? Because you don't have full control over what's going on. So when you come off, you're kind of like, okay, this is me. That was a little overblown. I can see where I got upset, but maybe that was, you know, but so from a patient's perspective, it, it can be hard. You know, I've tried to pull myself out of therapy because I'm like, I don't want to go down all these rabbit holes that are pointless. Like it's just me getting upset because my chemicals are balancing out and I'm changing my diet and my sleep is changing and things yeah. are moving. So like, this is not all an emergency or a crisis. It's just my chemicals are balancing out. And that really brings me a sense of peace. Like, oh, I'm not this, you know, emotionally volatile. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. It's not, it's yeah. not really me. Me is in there. It's just, yeah. just learning how to be in the world again. <laughs> yeah. So that's, and this, no, absolutely. And this is at the heart of actually working with somebody who is going through withdrawal. You kind of need to suspend what might be called normal therapy. Yeah. Because it comes around about, well, what is it that you're experiencing? You know, recognizing, validating, understanding where somebody's at in their process, understanding what their pattern is when they are going, you know, taking steps down off the drug, what helps them cope? And are there other strategies that might be helpful for them to link into? You don't have to be an expert in all of those coping strategies, but knowing that there's a list of them and knowing how to signpost somebody to those strategies is helpful. Um, and a, a lot of a lot of the work sometimes can just be reassurance. It can be about this is a this is a long term process and acceptance of where somebody is at can be at the heart of how far somebody really struggles with withdrawal. And this is something, again, that Baylissa, Baylissa said in her book a lot. Um, is that you're kind of on a road here. You're setting off on a journey. You can stress about every little bit of traffic that you hit along the way, or you can just accept that it's going to take the time that it's going to take. So, uh, uh, you know, acceptance of the journey as well um, can be part of it. But, hey, you know, every everybody's different. Some people are really angry about what's happened to them and they need a place to vent that. But we don't want therapy to be um to take the place of actual rightful anger about how somebody may have been treated and actually so many people do end up campaigning in whatever form is available to them because of that sense of injustice that sense of nobody told me and trying to ensure that other people don't experience that absolutely that's, that's why I do what I do for sure. You yeah. Nailed it. But you also touched on the most important thing for me when I was going through this experience was just my therapist saying, Angie, you're going to get better. This is not going to last forever. That does not take a skilled therapist. It just doesn't. It's so simple. It's just, you're okay. This is not really you. These are the chemicals. Your body's going to figure it out. Your brain is going to figure it out. You, you have a, you know, you're in a healing, your brain is always looking for healing. It's just, it just is, we just got to hold on and just having somebody next week to tell me that again. And next Tuesday at 10 AM to tell me that again, next to, you know, that was it. Yeah. It just doesn't take a whole lot, you know? So. No. And this is where, when we look at things like, um, one of the, one of the things that we've been campaigning for in the UK is to provide a 24 hour helpline for people to phone because a lot of the time people don't want 50 minutes of therapy each week they want five phone calls a day where somebody says hang in there you're going to be okay yeah you know it's a very different kind of um support system if you like that people people who are experiencing the worst kind of withdrawal they need that much more um intensive but um, shorter perhaps yeah. interaction it, it looks a bit different but at the moment given those services don't exist therapists are in a position to offer something unique because we are meeting our clients 50 minutes each week which is more than probably any other person involved in their care this is why we're in this cultural moment there's an opportunity for us to be doing this hopefully long term we won't need to but given where we are right now, there is that role we can play. Definitely. I want to go back to the guidance for just one minute. 
when you all were um, coming up with it, did you have voices of lived experience that informed the way the yeah. guns were? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, so right in our steering group, we had um, Luke Montague. And Luke has his own direct experience of um, prescribed drug dependence and withdrawal. And we decided very early on we wanted to invite experts by experience to be involved in creating the guidance. Um, so we had um, uh, an organisation called the National Service User Network, forgive me if I've got that wrong, in the UK, helped us find people who had had experience and we invited them in and we had some people who were directly involved in discussions about what should be in the guidance and then we had a whole other group of people who reviewed the guidance and gave us feedback so yeah that was that was really helpful to have that to have that view as well that is awesome all right so i think i'm going to go we have a, some questions from the audience let me let me ask you one of the questions since it's close okay Samaritans is a massive UK crisis line. What protocols and screenings do the Samaritans have in place for people phoning with adverse reactions or med withdrawal? So that's assuming that there's not a new phone line up set up just for people with prescribed drug dependence. Is there anything going on with Samaritans? Um, <clears throat> now, I, I stopped working with Samaritans quite a few years ago, so I can't speak directly to their um, policies but I have had some discussions with um, one of the senior people at Samaritans a couple of years ago and the, the difficulty is for Samaritans it's staffed by volunteers and um, they don't have um, complex and um, very effective systems for retraining everybody in everything they, they can't be experts in everything and so their real skill, what they're there to do is to listen. So um, at the moment, I don't believe they get any particular training around prescribed drugs and they would rely on the caller, helping them understand what it is they're going through. Um, but it's something that's been on, my back, on the back burner for me for a long time is potentially to work with Samaritans to create just a small amount of training for their volunteers to understand this. But as I say, it's not, it's not the easiest thing necessarily to, to achieve uh, uh, across the country. It's not, not kind of what they're really set up to do. Um, but, you know, as I say, it is a long time since I've had any direct involvement with them as an organization. Yeah, so we're working on it. It's coming, hopefully. Uh, yeah, well, you know, it's, we'll it's, there are so many things on the back burner. I would love to do it, but it's there's so many time. Things. And yeah. and somebody at Samaritans also saying, come do this. Yes, we, we would roll it out if you did it. But amazing. So my next question is um, we have we have a lot of therapists that watch and we have a lot of doctors that watch and doctors can op obviously be involved in the situation. Not only are they prescribing and helping a person taper, but they also have to have those skills to kind of work with someone in withdrawal. So for the therapists and doctors and prescribers, the professionals watching, what is the best way to work with someone that's taking or coming off of prescribed drugs? I guess there's different answers for those different professionals. So for therapists, it's kind of treat it like you would any other subject, be curious about it educate yourself, know enough to ask those critical questions, know enough when to stop doing therapy, read the guidance. Um, um, for, for doctors, I think a huge, there's, there's huge amount of um, material around the whole shared decision-making process. Uh, you know, it's a particular um, thing in the UK, shared decision-making, it gets talked of a lot. But there's such pressure on prescribers and the time they get with their patients that it can be really hard to make time for sharing good quality information, going into the benefits and the harms. Um, and particularly when somebody's thinking about coming off their drugs, 
making sure that they feel in control of the process. That seems to be something that comes across very strongly when you talk to people who've been through this, how important it is that they're able to do it at their pace. Um, and alongside considering the practical things of how is somebody actually going to create the dosage that you're asking them or that they should now do. Uh, but I think for all of this, for all of these professions, it's taking the time to go and look at the current evidence. You know, if, if you're a prescriber reading the latest edition of the Maudsley prescribing guidelines, which now contains information on each drug class on how to taper them. I mean, that, that's hugely beneficial. The um, Royal College of Psychiatrists leaflet on stopping antidepressants actually gives some really, really useful information about how to go about supporting a patient coming off antidepressants. So um, listening to the client, validating their experience, doing your own research and reading. Um, but there is a, in the guidance we summarize, you know, it's a, it's a common wisdom approach, we call it. And there's what you can do that's helpful before somebody starts withdrawing, during and after. And it's not rocket science, it really isn't, you know. It's preparing, what's their support network? What do their friends and family think about them coming off drugs? What do they understand might happen? You know, how are they going to record it? What are their plans? You know, it's, it's really basic stuff when you start stop and think about it. But in the guidance, we do provide all of that in quite a handy, accessible format. So um, that, that, I'm afraid that question is, you know, I could spend three weeks here or two minutes. So <laughs> that's the two minute answer. <laughs> but really, you're pointing to something I just thought about you know, not only do we just talk about informed consent going on psychiatric drugs, but also the informed consent coming off. It's not something yes. to be taken, you know, lightly. So maybe say something about that informed consent when you're coming off. Well, I was really pleased that, um, so in the UK, we have um, guidelines that prescribers work to called um, NICE guidelines, um, the National Institute for Clinical Health and Excellence. Um, and they're in the process of writing a guideline on safe prescribing and withdrawal. And we've seen now seen a first draft of that. And in that guidance, they are saying that there should be a treatment plan that is written down and agreed and shared between the prescriber and the patient that says this is how we are going to um, manage the withdrawal so that it is explicit, it is discussed, there are regular review points, um, there's a chance for somebody to be able to explore what it is that they are experiencing. So that, that will be a huge step forward because it's that it, it actually puts into the process officially the requirement to have that explicit discussion of shared decision-making and to document it. So I'm really hoping that makes it through to the final version of the guidance of the guideline that should come out next spring. So important. I love that. Um, the next question is about from the patient's perspective, um, finding a competent therapist seems to be pretty hard. And I myself am going through this right now. <laughs> so I know that um, it can be very tricky trying to screen a therapist to, you know, it's kind of like a job interview. You don't want to just go with whoever's given to you. Sure. Some people don't have the means to do that. I totally understand that. You know, your, your insurance in the United States would have you go to a certain person, perhaps in the NHS, you only get assigned to one person. I'm not sure, but can you talk about like, what are some ways that a client can look for a good therapist or ask the right questions when determining if they should work with a certain person in this experience? Sure. Um, <clears throat> We've been working in the UK with the professional bodies that when therapists kind of list themselves on directories and they say they have a profile and they say what they work with. And we've created boxes for prescribed drug dependence with those organisations. They're not all necessarily in the best place, but it's a work in progress. Certainly with UKCP and the National Counselling Society, there is a very clear box for prescribed drug dependence. So you can search for therapists who've said, I work with this issue. But then knowing what we know, I think you, there are supplementary questions you would ask. 
And in the UK, I would ask them, have they read this guidance? That's perfect. <laughs> That's perfect. In, in I'm, not the, saying, I'm not saying it's the only right answer, but no, you know. <laughs> are, are you willing to read it and I, print it out with you and bring it to your first appointment? Yeah. Yeah. And because there is a short version of it, it needn't be the long yeah. book-like version. Yeah. Uh, there is a there is a lot shorter version too um so yeah as you as you quite rightly pointed out what was so helpful in your experience with your therapist you were with somebody who was prepared to learn from you and actually as therapists we know we're learning from our clients all the time and the big thing with this is finding a therapist who is not afraid of having the conversations with you if you find somebody who says i'm not a doctor i can't speak to you about drugs then go somewhere else hit the road no that's that's what i say in the u.s is i ask i say to ask your doctor or your therapist what do you know about antidepressant withdrawal or what do you know about benzodiazepine withdrawal and then shut up don't don't say anything because the way that they answer that question will tell you everything you need to know. If they say, oh yeah, you can come off of those in two weeks and you'll be fine. You need to leave. You know, <laughs> like if they say it should be done in a very, you know, slow, thoughtful process, you know, I believe in harm reduction, you know, maybe you can't come all the way off, but we could, you know, get you down to a certain level. Uh, you know, this would be up to a shared decision between you and I, we could talk about it. That is who you want to be with. Yeah. In my experience. Yeah, absolutely. And I was reflecting earlier that um, the message does seem to be getting out there, you know, that I think the chances of finding somebody who is informed at least enough to know what they don't know and to be prepared to learn it, I think the chances are increasing, you know. Absolutely. I do. I do have a little bit of hope this morning. I was scrolling on Instagram and I spotted I hope she doesn't mind if I tell her, shout this out, but Dr. Ellen Vora, who's actually in the film, I saw her uh, Instagram come up and she said yeah. she had a cute little meme about, do you think I'm crazy? I'm a psychiatrist who helps people taper off of drugs. And I was just reading the comments and the comments, I was like, I was like, am, am I seeing things? Like, is this real? <laughs> because the comments were like, you know, yay, we need more doctors like you. Yay. This is an important subject. Nobody talks about but it was like 200 comments. And I just, wow. I just, my jaw like dropped. Like I was like, this would not have happened six years ago. People were not. No, you know, well, something's changing. It is absolutely. And I'm hoping the guidance is, uh, has had a small impact. I mean, I know that it's been downloaded around 20,000 times now in the last two years, it's being translated into five languages. I've had messages from people in Australia. I know, um, certainly people in America and Canada that pe that people are finding it and people are using it you know so it's slowly getting out there that is amazing so now let's let's move on to the other organizations can you talk about just for people both in the UK and the US you know what is CEP UK what is IIPDW what is, you know all these these initials let's talk about like from a macro perspective what is going on in the withdrawal world? Who are the players? Who are the people that are trying to help this issue? I guess that's the question. Yeah, well, gosh. So I guess on the international stage, um, the Institute, International Institute for Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal, which is now chaired by Professor John Reed, um, who is at the University of East London, UEL. I think I've got that right. Sorry, John, if I haven't. Um, He's doing great work with the IOPDW, and I think he took over from Rob, was Robert Whitaker actually the previous chair? So he Robert was, was certainly yeah, he, was yeah, he, set, well. he, yeah he kind of set it up, didn't he? And I was really lucky to go to the first meeting of the IOPDW in Gothenburg um, in 2019, and that was so fantastic having a chance to meet with all of these people that you kind of hear about and that you see on Twitter and whatever. So. Um, meeting Alto Strata and uh, Mark Horowitz and all of these people. It was wonderful to be able to uh, actually meet, meet some people. So um, they're, they're doing great work in helping people understand what's happening around the world. And it's, it's such an important support network because it can be so 
demoralizing when you know there's a huge system that's in place that we're trying to it's a huge super tanker that we're trying to influence the direction of and at times it can feel like you're getting nowhere and it's so important to have a group of colleagues you can turn to and either get hope from or inspiration from or just vent that things aren't going the way you'd hope that they would go so um the IIPDW is doing a range of really good work internationally um CEP, the Council for Evidence-Based Psychiatry, was founded by Dr. James Davies and Luke Montague. Um, and it's got some really illustrious members. And I was really delighted to have been um, invited to join them a couple of years ago, including John Reed, including Professor uh, Joanna Moncrief and Sammy Tamimi. And there's a whole host of people, Peter Kinderman, who are in um, uh, CEP. I mean, when I say a whole host, there's probably only about 12 of us who are members. <laughs> um, so it's a small group of people, but who are all passionate and who are all um, very focused in their individual work in moving this conversation forward professionally in their different groups. So as I say, CEP is quite a small organization, but it provides the secretariat function for the all party parliamentary group for prescribed drug dependence in the UK. And Luke and James and I and Peter Kinderman formed the secretariat for that group. And it is through the all party parliamentary group that we have been able to probably have the biggest influence, I would say. We've been very lucky with the parliamentarians that have been involved in the group. Um, and we were able to influence Public Health England conducting a real thorough review of prescribed drug dependence and producing a report with some very important recommendations in it in terms of education of both the public and prescribers, um, the kind of services that are needed both locally and a national helpline and website. So there are really some key um, recommendations that got produced by Public Health England. I mean, I can largely speak about the UK experience and what's going on here. I'm afraid I'm not as aware of what's happening um, in, our, in other places around the world. Perhaps you can tell me in a minute what's nothing, happening nothing. in America. <laughs> <laughs> not much, not much in the US, but I'll, I'll follow up. Go ahead. <laughs> well, with the, with the Public Health England report that got produced in 2019, and there's now a group of people in our NHS England and improvement who are responsible for implementing those recommendations. And Luke and I sit on the advisory board, as just John Reed, we sit on the advisory board for that project. So we're getting documents to review, we're starting to see how they're going to implement those recommendations. So next spring, there will be a framework for action, is what it's called being published, which will require NHS commissioners to put services in place locally for prescribed drug dependence. And that's huge. That's now, huge. you know, clearly, what kind of services based on what kind of information, who's going to deliver those services, um, how are they going to link into people with lived experience, because that's vital, those are all really big questions and we hope to be moving on to talking with the NHS about, well, how can we as a group help you access all of this experience and all of this information that's out there? How can we be part of co-create these services with you? So having got it this far, that they're actually saying they will create services, can we now be part of the process that helps create those services? Um, one of them, the Department of Health and Social Security is meant to be coming up with a plan of how to implement a national helpline and website for it. Again, that's a conversation we want to be part of. And the all party parliamentary group, we're inviting people from those departments to come tell us, come talk to us. You know, what's the plan? How can we be involved? How can we help support you do this? Um, so we're really interested in how can we help the patient's voice be heard 
in by those people who are then actually creating the services so that's that 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 sentence really as you were speaking i was thinking in my head i've seen patients talking about this for decades yeah and, and their voices have not been heard but then you get a small group of professionals who lobby at the highest levels of government and you know guild and and things seem to slowly slowly be changing that's in the uk I, so i don't know like can you just explore that for a minute like why is it that from your point of view why has this been ignored for so long because there's so much suffering happening unfortunately and it seems to be the case across a variety of issues um where you've got lone patients going through particular problems with any kind of medical intervention or procedure it's only when they start banding together that they start to get any power so initially it's just thought oh it's an individual problem it's your problem it's not it's not the system and you kind of have to gather gather the systemic evidence to say no this is a system problem it's not an individual problem it's a system problem and so many people have done so much work now for the last 10 20 years in gathering collating and providing that systemic evidence in a way that the powers that be have to listen to that i think we're now reaching this tipping point where the voice of the patient can be heard in a way the system can hear it that's that, that's yeah, I think you're right. Because I, from my own experience, I I did a um, legislative fellowship where I went to the United States Capitol and I got to speak one on one with our oh. you know congressmen. And I had written a, a research paper about benzodiazepines and veterans and how we are given so much, and that just benzodiazepine exposure increases their likelihood of suicide 2.5 times. Like. Oh. That's not a little problem, you know, no. that, but that our suicide rate is so high. But as I'm speaking to these congressmen and their aides, it was like, I could see the light turn off. Like they weren't even listening to me and it wasn't in my delivery because I'd practiced my delivery with all these people and made sure, you know, I had all this like mentorship to make sure my pitch was perfect and all this. And I was like, what am I not? what am I, I'm not hitting something that make is helping them understand what I'm saying. And I, and all I could, all I could really leave that experience with was there's other voices that are louder than yours that like meant throwing money at mental health is going to help the problem. We have the system set up to help this problem. We're going to fix it. We have it under control. Those voices and the, those powerful figures have more power than I do trying to explain it from a different point of view. But anyway, I left that experience just feeling like totally defeated. Like, how am I supposed to to fix this you know so my route has been like okay get away from trying to do systemic change and educate patients one-on-one -on -one. so like right now me and you are having this conversation all the patients in the audience cons consumers clients whatever word you identify with they're learning about all these issues they're learning how to be be better clients how to talk yes. to a therapist how to talk to a prescriber how to not take if if the clinician is not using your voice as part of that decision making process how to find a new doctor so that's what's been important to me is like i can't do the systemic change it was just so dehumanizing to me like i don't get it you know what anyway so i think that's so important that last sentence you said banding enough evidence together that they can't not listen anymore you're elevating that patient voice and saying this yes is real. well and also generating the research and the information that is going to change minds so economic information so recently um dr james davies and professor joanna moncrief collaborated on some research with ruth cooper as well um looking at how much it costs how much unnecessary prescribing costs our national health service and it's 500 million pounds a year wow. is spent on unnecessary prescribing so you start to build a case that says well this is a this is a no-brainer that we should be putting in services to help people withdraw um, given how much it's costing so it's finding the arguments that the people who have the power will listen to and being persistent <laughs> persistent but polite yes is key and you know understandably there's a lot of anger there's a lot of people who've had their lives ruined by these drugs 
Um, but unfortunately, um, when anger and emotion comes into um, the, the presentation of a case too much, I think there needs to be a certain amount of realizing how big an issue it is for people. So, you know, very often in our meetings, we always try and include somebody with lived experience or somebody's on the front line in the service to bring it to life. This isn't just a piece of paper. These are people's lives. But you can only do that so much before you, you've got to be talking about the evidence that matters to the people that you are talking to. Absolutely. That's game theory, I think it's called. I studied that yeah. in college, game theory. You have to know what what those people want and yeah yeah, wow, yeah i love that i love that discussion just thinking about that all right so we have eight minutes left let me wait before we move on what can you talk about in the future i think you touched on some guidelines coming out in the uk can you see anything else that's happening in the future in the international scene that maybe we should know about um I know that, um, so in the UK, we've got the safe prescribing withdraw and withdrawal guideline coming out in the spring alongside a new version of the depression guidance, really key as to what they're gonna say about antidepressant withdrawal in that. There's gonna be this commissioning framework. Um, there should be a plan from our Department of Health and Social Security for how they're gonna implement a helpline. Um, so there's all of this, movement happening in the UK. The only other thing I know of happening more broadly is the Council of Europe actually commissioned a report um, into involuntary tranquilizer addiction. They, 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 that's how it started off. And it was actually um, one of the early chairs of the all-party parliamentary group kicked this off many years ago. It happened 10 years ago or more that they got this report being written by the European Commission, and they are about to produce a report that should impact the whole of Europe. Now, it's not, it's a little bit too focused on opioids, I think. It's a little bit too focused on comparing Europe with what's happening in the States as far as opioids is concerned. And of course, that's a very different picture. However, antidepressants are mentioned in it. Um, and it's one of the things on my thing to do list is to actually respond, write a draft response to this European Commission draft report, which you can find online um, to see if we can influence what comes out of that. But I've, it's one of those things I have no idea what impact it will have when it is published. Let's see. Yeah, it's still a movement in the right direction, right? Yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. And I, and I just I guess I should say here in the US. I don't know of anything happening. I really just do not. I asked Swapno Gupta recently, you know, why has the US kind of ignored this issue while the UK seems to be light years ahead in a lot of ways? And she said it just hasn't been an, an interest or a topic at the APA conference. And I've been to an AK, AK, APA conference myself and um, I've seen all the different courses, you know, all the different classes you can attend, the different conferences, the different poster presentations. I didn't see anything there. If anything, it was moving towards psychedelics, moving towards the um, glutamate hypothesis. There wasn't it was just more, it was just more of the same biomedical. So I, I don't, I hate, to, oh my God, it's just so depressing to think about that. Like we are not, there's, there's many clinicians out there that know about this, that we put on our interviews regularly. But other than that, I don't know of any widespread change from the US point of view. All right, so let's, I'm gonna hit, there's two questions I'd like to ask you. One, I'm gonna ask it in a different way because the person's asking very um, specific medical advice and I, obviously we are not gonna answer that. So basically, what does, it, what does the client do, the person who's suffering, what kind of um, taper advice can they trust? Because there's a lot of stuff out there. So maybe from a therapist's point of view, what taper guidance can a therapist trust? What are some of the, the trustworthy sources for taper guidance and, and protocols coming off? Sure. Um, it's difficult because I wouldn't expect a therapist to get into detailed tapering advice with a client. Um, however, we would 
signpost some information that they could signpost their prescriber to. So in the UK, there's this particular leaflet published by the Royal College of Psychiatrists called Stopping Antidepressants, which um, gives some information about slow tapering. The other big thing we've got in the UK, thanks to the work of Mark Horowitz and David Taylor, is the Maudsley Prescribing Guidelines. Um, that that now includes detailed information about how to taper. And the Maudsley Prescribing Guidelines is usually the go-to document, the go-to book for most psychiatrists, but it's important they have the latest version because it was updated in 2021 with this new information about deprescribing. And in terms of things that are coming next year, well, maybe this year, um, I understand that there is a the Maudsley deprescribing guidelines in its own right as a book, that they are working on that, I, I understand. Um, so um, th those are two very specific public sources of information, plus pretty much anything written by Mark Horowitz. <laughs> He's one of our favorites. What about yep. I hear, the, the thing that I didn't hear you say was about the layperson guidance? I would be directing people to online sources at that point. It would be in a compass. It would be surviving antidepressants. It would be the online communities of people who are sharing this information. Unfortunately, at the moment, I'm not aware of any um, um, official, certainly, you know, from any kind of health body in the UK place to go to because they, they're expected to get it from their doctors. So it, it is that, you know, the best of the, the online community and my goodness, haven't they done a massively brilliant job over the last 20 years in supporting everybody. Yeah. Someone uh, commented, you hit on something very important. If the patient was simply reassured that their experience, you know, that what they were going through was okay, you know, is real, it could be the difference between life and death. That's how yeah. important it is. Yeah. 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 I mean, we, we know that some of the extreme experiences can be so difficult. You know, if you're in the throes of long lasting, severe akathisia, then that's hard, no matter what reassurance to cling on to hope. And that just sounds like, you know, living hell for some people, you know, but that daily reassurance, it will end it will end is, is all that sometimes can be done, which is a very impotent feeling, I think, for any healthcare person, anybody involved in care to, 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 to say, to recognize, but um, it, it's the validation. It's knowing that it's not you. It's knowing that it's, um, this is about the drug and that being recognized is hugely important. And we did some analysis of, um, some petition responses that came into petitions that were lodged in Scotland and Wales. There are over 150 of these people had written in with their own stories, their own you know, narratives of what happened to them. And we analyzed all of these responses and not having their experiences validated was one of the biggest single common things that they all talked about and what damage that did because it meant that all the people around them thought, oh, it's just you, because that's what the doctor's saying. So yeah, whoever's asked that question, yeah, it is hugely important. Yeah. So that brings us to our last little question, comment. I always like to leave our audience with, with a you know ray of hope, something positive. So yeah. what words would you like to leave with our audience that would inspire hope and healing today? I can't... I don't have my own experience of this. There are lots of people better qualified than me, you included, to talk about, you know, healing on an individual level. I guess I'm coming at this from a collective point of view. I'm looking at this from a, a systemic change point of view. And there are times when I go through real, you know, pessimist phases that nothing's ever going to change. We're not going to see any services. But I've actually started to get some, I think, quite realistic hope 
that 2022 might be the year in the, in the UK that we start to see services actually commissioned to support people who are experiencing this. And that's that will be huge. That would be amazing. And it's thanks, thanks to the collective efforts of so many people over such a long period of time that we may be finally reaching that point where it becomes mainstream enough for a serve for services to be commissioned. But and hopefully that will roll over into the US somehow. That is my hope. Or or our collective voices will come together at a certain point in 2022. That would be awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. And one of the big things, the benefits of if we can get a helpline off the ground, you can start to gather evidence, you can start to gather data, which then just reinforces the scale of the issue and what people need. So hopefully that will then just be the start point of something which can then grow and develop over time. Amazing. All right, well, I think we cleared all the comments and questions for now. Um, I know that uh, Sheila put a lot, of, a lot of links in the comment section, so be sure to refer to those later. And I just wanna say thank you, Dr. Guy, for everything that you're doing, for all the, the shoes that you have to wear and the hats you have to change. And it's just so beneficial. And, you know, we were talking about this before we went live, but, you know, for you to not even have personal experience, but to for you to be so passionate about this, it just means a lot to us, to people like me. I just want you to know thank that. You. Thank yeah. you. That's really hard to say. Thank you. All right. So thank you all in the audience for joining us for this live discussion. If you haven't seen Medicating Normal yet, please check out our website at medicatingnormal.com slash watch. I know how many times have you seen it, Dr. Guy? Like three, oh, uh, three times at least. Three times. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> It's good. Go watch it. Now, if you're in the U.S., it is airing on PBS right now. If you go to our website, you'll see all the listings for public television. Um, more dates are being added. We just got another batch of dates last night. So please go watch. And also, I want to say, if you don't see your city listed, we've been having great success with people writing to their station and asking the programmer to put it on the schedule. So if you don't see your city, please do that little piece of advocacy. That's kind of what we're talking about with Dr. Guy. You know, every little pebble in the sea is going to help. All right. And lastly, you know, we have these conversations every week. We have Selma Eichenblum coming up, who's going to talk about the PY350 enzyme in the liver that makes drugs hard to metabolize and a couple other really cool people coming up. So be sure to tune in. All right. So that's it. Um, thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, Dr. Guy, for your work and for having this conversation with me. Um, I, I know I learned even more and I'm sure people, the learning will continue in the audience. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right. Have a good one. Okay. Goodbye, Bye. Bye. Bye.